the way that you give. Amen. 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 Well, I think that takes care of all the, the welcoming and the housekeeping, and, and I'm ready to go to the Word. How about you? Amen. 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 So, Lord, we do, as we come to your Word this morning, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to open our eyes and hearts and teach us, reveal to us your Word, and, uh, and help us to see how we should apply it to our life, what, how it means to us. Lord, I'm humbled before you and ask that you use me in just in a, in a great way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. <clears throat> so we're continuing in a series called After the Cross, which is more like after the resurrection. And we've talked about it every week. Let's bring everybody up to speed. After Jesus was resurrected, he didn't go directly to heaven. He stayed around for 40 days. And he taught the kingdom of God and got the disciples ready for their mission that was going to take place when he ascended in heaven. And what this series is, is looking at the, there's at least a dozen times in scripture when Jesus appeared and connected with his disciples. And every one of those where we see what he said, there's life lessons and applications to be learned in there. Week one, we saw him meet the mountain, the disciples on a mountain in Galilee, and some doubted. So we saw how to deal with doubt. Week two, they, he met them at the lake uh, of Galilee when they'd gone back to their old life. And we talked about how there's always a pull back to the old life. But don't let that happen to you because God has a, a new life for you. Week three, Pastor Jordan talked about the two disciples when he met the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and they had lost hope because it didn't turn out and like they thought it would. And Pastor Jordan talked to us about waiting between when God reveals something and when he releases something in our life. It's a great word. Last week, I talked to you about Jesus meeting with Peter on the shore of Galilee, and he had already forgiven him, but Peter needed something more than forgiveness. He needed to be restored. He needed to be brought back, and so Jesus restored him beautifully and creatively, and then Jesus transformed him, and so we talked about the need not just to be forgiven and have a ticket. Let me tell you something. We need more than just a ticket to heaven. He's got a whole life for us, but we're never going to live the fullest life if we're not transformed and restored. So today, as I said, we're going to go to Acts chapter 1 in honor of Pentecost Sunday because one of the most important meetings that Jesus had with his disciples had to do with Pentecost Sunday. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 1. As I said in our opening, all over the world today, right now, churches are celebrating the fact that it's Pentecost Sunday. And you might say, well, pastor, you mean all around the world Pentecostal churches are celebrating the day of Pentecost. No, 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 no. I'm telling you all types of churches, Orthodox, Lutheran, Anglican, Church of England, Reformed churches, all types, Catholic churches, Protestant churches. In fact, in Europe, Pentecost Sunday is actually, in most of the European nations, a public national holiday. Go figure. And, and they've changed the name in recent years to Whit Sunday, but everybody knows it's Pentecost Sunday, and it's a national holiday by all denominations recognized. And what is Pentecost Sunday? Pentecost Sunday is the day we celebrate the birth of the church. The birth, it's the church's birthday. Everybody say, Happy birthday, church. Just like at Christmas, we celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus, and we say, we teach our children December 25th the birthday of Jesus, but we're really making that up because we don't know what his birthday is. We just picked a day, and we said it's December 25th. Well, it's different with Pentecost Sunday. We actually know the day. It was today. It was, it was 50 days after. The word Pentecost actually just means, Pente this means 50. 50 days, 49 weeks and one days. And uh, after, after Passover, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, we celebrate the birth of the church. The birth of the church was on the day of Pentecost in either A.D. 30 to A.D. 33. That's the one thing we don't, we don't know exactly our age, but we do know our birthday. So we are either, I figure, 1988 or 1991 years old today. Okay, so it has to do with, in fact, can I teach you for just a minute? Can I put my teacher hat on? Can you put your student hat on just a minute? Because this, this has application. In the Old Testament, God ordained and instituted three feasts. Everybody say feast or festivals. Really, they were like holidays. But they were, they were commanded, 
obligatory feast for his people to celebrate. And on each of these feast days or feast week, everyone who was close enough to Jerusalem to come to Jerusalem would come to Jerusalem. And the three feasts were this, and I'm going to teach you for five minutes here. First of all was the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Love and Leavened Bread. And the, each one of these feasts commemorated something in the nation's history. The Feast of fast, the f- peace, the feast, come on, Tom. The Feast of Passover commemorated when God set his people free from slavery in Egypt. Okay? If you know the story, if you've watched the, the movie Ten Commandments or whatever, you know that you know, God sent Moses and God sent the ten plagues to force and to cause Pharaoh to set the people free, but Pharaoh wasn't cooperating. But the tenth plague was a plague of death of the firstborn. And God said, a death angel is going to come and bring death to you. But he said, I want you to take a lamb to his people and shed the blood of that lamb. Put that lamb on your doorpost. And, and when the death angel comes, which was kind of scary. Y'all, y'all remember that movie? Kind of a dark cloud kind of moving down the road. It was kind of scary. Well, when the death cloud or the death angel comes to your house, where, the, where, where I see the blood of the lamb, I will pass over and death and judgment won't come on that house. And that's what the children of Israel did. And they were spared the judgment and the death. And that's why we call it Passover. And so God said, now, from now on forever, I want you once a year to celebrate Passover as a festival. Now, the second feast is 50 days later. And that's the only reason they use the word Pentecost it just means 50th. And it, 50 days later was the Feast of Weeks, or seven weeks and a day. And the Feast of Pentecost that commemorated the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Remember the story when Moses went up on the mountain and, and he said, God said, bring some stone tablets. And God etched his, God took his own finger and etched the law in the Ten Commandments into that stone tablets. And then Moses and Aaron came bringing it down the mountain, right? Well, that's what that commemorated, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And that's why the people were all gathered on the day of Pentecost to celebrate that. Okay, it's a big feast. And then the third one is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles or ingathering. They call it the Feast of Ingathering because it happened after the harvest was gathered in. And they came together and they celebrated the third holiday of the year. And the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths commemorated the time when after their descendants had been set free from slavery, they wandered for 40 years without a home. They, it took them 40 years to reach home, to the homeland. And so they lived for 40 years in booths and tents and temporary structure. So once a year, God said, hey, I want you to build a booth or a tent and get out and live in it for a little while during this festival week in the, in the festival of booths. So these were the three births. Now, now, as you study the Bible and you come to the New Testament, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy all that, but I came to fulfill it. Remember that? He said, I didn't come to do away with all these feasts. I just came to fulfill them. And in fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he said that all of these things actually were given as an example or a model for us who believe in Christ today. And so all three of these feasts have been fulfilled in Christ. The feast of Passover, the feast of Passover, it's, it's kind of obvious to see where the blood of the lamb is seen, I'll pass over. And Jesus became the Lamb of God, right, who shed his blood on the cross so that once and for all there would be no need for another lamb to die because the Lamb of God had died for us and his blood was shed. And when you put your faith in that shed blood, death will pass over you. Aren't you glad death is going to pass over you? Amen. And judgment will pass over you. So it was fulfilled in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and in salvation through faith in the blood of Jesus. Now, the Feast of Weeks, the the Feast of Pentecost, is fulfilled in the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. Uh, There's a little thing that you might find interesting if you study. You could just teach all day on it. But, you know, on that day that Moses was given the law, if you'll remember, when he went up on that mountain, the Bible said there was a great noise, remember, and there was a great wind, and there was fire in the sky, and God came down and wrote the law on the tablets in this, in this loud, wind-blowing storm. It scared the people crazy. 
And then Moses came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and he heard a noise. And you remember what was happening down at the bottom? And down in the valley, his people had gone Jerry Springer on him, and they had built him a golden calf, got out of their clothes, and went to dancing like heathens do, just gone crazy. And, 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 and so what actually happened that day was their sinfulness brought a curse or a plague on them. And if you'll read it carefully, 3,000 people died because of that plague that day. Now, fast forward to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Was there, there was fire, there was wind, and there was a great noise, and God poured his spirit out. And this was his promise. He said, now... The law will no longer be written in stone, but I'm going to come in and write it on your heart. And that's what he did that day. He moved in on the inside of us, and he wrote what had been written in stone. Now is written in our heart. And how many? And then Peter got filled with the Holy Spirit, and he went over and he began to preach. And guess what happened? Three thousand people got saved and born again that day. Amen. Do you see that? Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? There's all kinds of stuff like that. Just the mirror image of the day of. Of, of, of that what happened on Mount Sinai and then the feast of booths is the only feast that hasn't been fulfilled yet because the feast of booths will, will and the feast of tabernacles or in gathering is going to be fulfilled when we get to heaven because how many of you know we're not home yet right we're we're strangers we're journeying in a land God wants to remind you not to get too settled here because this is not your home okay and that's the one feast that's going to be fulfilled and we're all looking forward to it and so that, that teaching, we'll come back to that in a minute and make that make even more sense. But here we go in Acts chapter 1. Here's the post-resurrection encounter that Jesus had. And I'm going to take time to read all first verses, eight verses of Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O Theophilus. Now, who was Theophilus? Remember, Luke wrote both the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Both of them were dedicated to who, a man, a, a Roman, a Greek man, a Gentile man, who was probably Luke's patron. In other words, he probably supported Luke in the writing of these documents. His name was Theophilus. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he'd given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. That's what we've been talking about. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. He said, don't go home. I mean, these guys lived about 70 miles north in Galilee. They were in Jerusalem for the feast like everybody. He said, don't go home. He said, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Here's an indication they still didn't quite get this thing yet. They still didn't understand what was going on. And he said, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But here it is, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then in all Judea, which is southern Israel, Samaria, northern Israel, and then all the way to the end of the earth. You will be my witnesses. You will have power to be my witnesses after you receive the Holy Spirit. And that's the promise of the Father. He had talked about this promise if you want to study this, in John 14, 15, and 16, before he'd gone to the cross, he had told them about the promise. Let's look at some of those verses. John 16, verse 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's better for you that I go away than if I were to stay. Now, that had to just, like, blow the disciples away. He was talking about leaving them. They thought that was the worst thing that could possibly happen. He says, no, you don't understand. There's some stuff you don't know yet. I'm telling you, trust me. It's better if I'm not here and I go away. Why? Because when I go away, I'm going to send the helper. Helper. Everybody say helper. Your Bible may say comforter. It may say advocate. It may say several things. The Greek word is parakletos. Parakletos. Para meaning alongside. Kletos means to call. 
The word literally means to call alongside, to take hold of it together with. I'm going to send the helper. He's going to come in alongside you and take hold of life together with you. You know this Holy Spirit, for he already dwells with you, but soon he's going to be in you, the parakletos. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, then he taught them some things that I'll run real quickly with you that he said the Holy Spirit will do. He said in John 14, verse 26, this helper will teach you everything and cause you to remember, which is good news to a 64-year-old, all, <laughs> all that I told you. I mean, we talked about a lot, and you try, I mean, you try to take notes, and I mean, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit's going to teach you everything you need to know and he's going to cause you to remember all I've told you. The helper is the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. And so the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to teach you. You know, in so many places in the New Testament, we see that you really cannot discern the things of God with your natural mind. It doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean it's not logical. It just means without the help of the Holy Spirit, you won't get it, right? You're just not going to get it. And so you need to, when you come to the Word of God, in fact, the Bible says that the letter of the law will kill you, but the spirit of the, spirit of the Word will give you life. People take the Word of God without the Holy Spirit and minister death to people, meaning well. There are churches, and don't get me started on this, I'm going to get off my message. There are churches with the name Bible in their name. In fact, I'm, 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 just going, I'm just going to tell you something. Sadly, the body of Christ is kind of divided into two camps. One camp in which we are. You say, are you Pentecostal? Yes, we are, but we're not real crazy about that word. Why? Because you know, what do you think when you hear the word Pentecostal? What do you think when you hear, or right, they go to a Pentecostal church? What do you think? I mean, there's several, you think, well, they, you know, over there where they act like crazy. Man, I went to that Pentecostal church, and I went, oh, my God, I ain't never going back there again. I ain't never, good Lord, what was that all about? And, and you know, y'all know those churches? And, and, and they say, well, that's Pentecostal. That's not Pentecostal. That's just the way people do church. Y'all got to love me. You got to love me. If you don't love me, you might go to hell. <laughs> you just got to love I, I, I'm too old to play with it anymore it's just the way they do church it's a religious way they do now i'm not saying that the holy spirit won't do something you ain't never seen before he he, he may well do something that just is so different i mean jesus led by the holy spirit when somebody came up and needed prayer the holy he he spit on his finger and anointed the guy's tongue how many of y'all want prayer today on your tongue come down here i pray for that's pretty weird, but you know what? The person was healed. Another time, he reached down and picked up some dirt and spit in it. He used to spit a lot. Made mud and put it in the guy's eyes. That's weird, but you know what? The blind eye was healed. I've been around this a long time, folks, and the difference is when it's the Holy Spirit. When you're somewhere and people are just acting in the flesh, there's a feeling in you that you just want to, like, you wish there was a hole in the floor to get in. You know what I'm saying? But I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit can do something just as unusual, but you won't have that feeling. You'll have a sense of awe, a sense of, oh, my word, my Lord, my God. And you'll see him do something amazing for you, even if it's something different. Does that make sense to you? And so it's not just about what I call excesses and oddities. See, when you think Pentecostal, when I think I was raised in the Pentecostal holiness movement, they had me coming from both ways. Pentecostal meant they acted strange. Holiness meant you couldn't do nothing. The way you knew it was a sin is if you enjoyed it. <laughs> if there was any fun in it, it was on the don't list. And that all got brought under Pentecostal. So you think of Pentecostal people and you see women that won't wear pants and pile their hair up on their head in a bun, which I'm not. Now, some of them were the holiest, God-fearingest, and some of those women were the one I want on my head if I need prayer. 
Because some of them, ha they have to love Jesus more than I do to go through what they went through. But they didn't need to go through it. Some you know, they wouldn't wear makeup. And I just want you ladies to know we are for makeup. <laughs> We're for it. <laughs> Whatever it takes, sister. Amen. <laughs> or brother. <laughs> Whatever. No, no, no. All of this kind of odd excess thing come under the term Pentecostal. So when you say, are you a Pentecostal church? I'm hesitant to say, yeah, we're a Pentecostal church because you don't know what Pentecostal is. But if you go to the Bible and find out what happened on the day of Pentecost, when God caused the third person of the Godhead to come and take up residency, he tagged Jesus on the way out of the earth. And Jesus said, you got it. And the Holy Spirit said, I got it. You go sit on the throne. I'll go down and manifest your lordship in the earth. I'll go down and be their friend and their helper. I'll take hold of life together with them. Not only will I help them live godly lives, which they can't do without me, but I'll give them miracle power. I'll cause them to be able to do the things. Jesus said, if I'm, I'm going away. If I go away, you'll be able to do things greater than I did. And, and you just go, what? Jesus, you raised the dead. You fed 5,000. Well, Jesus said, it's in red letters in your Bible, that you will do greater things than I did after the Holy Spirit comes on you. So there's some power up in that thing. But there's a great part of the church that has denied. They're, they're known as, we're called continuist. If you don't know what I am, don't use the word Pentecostal. Use the word continuist. Write it down. Which is in opposition to cessationist. Because a great part of the body of Christ believes that all that God does through the Holy Spirit, the miracles, the speaking, the word, all of that ceased when the apostles died and no longer. In fact, I went, I was thinking about a school, a college that I was familiar with earlier in life and wondered if they were still cessationist. And I went to their website of this, of this school of divinity, a school of theology, and I looked at their statement of fact, and here's what I read. We affirm that the miraculous spiritual gifts given to the early church have since ceased and are no longer being experienced today. And I just go, how sad. Let's go up there and enroll in that school and learn how to do ministry. You know, again, I'm trying to teach five lessons in one here, and I've got 12 minutes and 42 seconds to go. But I, I've got it figured out again. I've been, I, di I didn't just walk over the hill last night. I'm telling you, when I was in working on my graduate, when I was in working on my master's degree, our seminary professor had the wisdom to give us two textbooks in, in uh, systematic theology. One was a cessationist textbook, and another was a continuist textbook. And when I read the cessationist textbook, I saw it because, see, there are lots of gifts of the Spirit in the Bible. Let me just tell you what some of them are. This, again, we'll be back, we'll be back in just a moment to the, to, the, to the line I was going. But listen, they are, in Romans, there's prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy. All the Bible says they're gifts and abilities given you by the Holy Spirit in you. It's not you. In 1 Corinthians, there's word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miracles, prophecies, the distinguishing of spirits, tongues, and interpretations of tongues. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, helps, administration, tongues, pastor, teacher, all of these gifts. This cessationist textbook took these 20 or 25 gifts of the Holy Spirit and made two columns, those who had ceased and those who continued. And I noticed immediately, it didn't take me long to notice. Let me tell you some of those who had ceased. Listen, uh, prophecy had ceased. Words of wisdom or words of knowledge. That's when God helps you know something there's no way that you would know. Uh, and we've seen it in this very place. Uh, gifts of healings, miracles, prophecy, tongues, interpretation prophet. All of those were in the ceased category. But in the continuing category were teaching, exhortation, giving. Of course, we don't want that to cease. <laughs> Amen. Leadership. 
mercy. Those gifts. Now, do you, can y'all see already what's happened here? They've decided that everything in the Bible that the Bible calls a gift of the Holy Spirit that I can do myself without God, if it doesn't take the miraculous, we believe it's still a gift of the Spirit. But if it takes the miraculous, then we believe that ceased. And I thought, there's no way I'm going for it. How, well, I'll tell, tell you what I wrote, and my professor didn't like it too good. I said, how proud of this man to think he could go to the Bible and take a list of the gifts of the spirits, and you say what ceased and what didn't cease. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about any of it ceasing. And then they came up with some reasons like, well, we don't need God to speak anymore because we have his word. We have the 66 books of the Bible, and that's God speaking, so you don't need to hear from God anymore and things like that and just takes the life out of it. So I came to tell you, technically, yes, we're Pentecostal, but not bun wearing, no fun, come on now, shouting, oddy, weird, for weirdness sake, Pentecostal. What I am is a continuist as opposed to a cessationist. Can I get an amen? Because I believe everything God ever did in this church, he'll do right here this morning for you. Amen. And I've seen it all happen with my own very eyes. Now, I know experience is not enough to form a doctrine, but experience sure helps a doctrine come along. Amen. The saddest thing in the world is to see somebody who doesn't believe God still heals talking to somebody who got healed by God, trying to convince them God don't heal anymore. It ain't going to work. <laughs> I don't care what you show me. It's kind of like, like the guy that, 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 that they came to Jesus and they said, well, well, whether he's a prophet or not, I don't know. All I know is I was blind, but now I can see. Explain that to me. And they said, oh, get out of here. You're a devil too. And so, you know, it's just hard. And, and, and it's hard to have, like somebody, I've seen God move in the supernatural gifts of his Holy Spirit. Speak things you could no way know. Speak, give you knowledge you could way know. Give you faith you could no way have. No way have. Man, I'm sitting in a restaurant last night celebrating my birthday. And I look across the table at a couple over there. And I saw the woman in a black funeral dress, sitting in a funeral. And we just kind of connected with them and had a conversation with them. I don't know what, I mean, this, you can say, well, that's weird. Well, I don't even understand it all. So we got into a conversation with them. And as we got in our conversation, she said, yeah, we're not from Macon. We're here for my aunt's funeral. Now, you see, those kind of things, I just said, well, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. God was preparing me to minister to these people, talk to these people. And that's just, that's just the latest rendition. I've got some much more exciting ones that where God has done incredible. Brother Ernest, where are you? Brother, you've got some exciting ones. Brother, prophet of God came in here one day and changed. I mean, God, he didn't change your life, but God changed your life because he called you out because he knew things he wasn't supposed to know. <laughs> Amen. And it's awesome. Where am I? Seven minutes out. Praise God. Let me, give you, let me tell you what the Holy Spirit does in my life. Let's, we'll, we'll move on to this. Number one, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live a godly life. The Holy Spirit empowers. I started a thought a while ago that I didn't finish. Talking about churches that don't believe in the present-day power of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times, now I'm not saying everybody that has a Bible in your church name is like that. But it's uncanny how many churches who don't believe in the present-day ministry of the church will call themselves such-and-such such Bible church. And sometimes they'll add New Testament only on the end of it. Okay, now I'm not judging anybody. We're all going to go get to heaven. We're going to find out where we were right and wrong and where you were right and wrong. I'm not judging. I'm just teaching my flock, okay? And you think, well, how can somebody put Bible in? It's because... They are so against the move of the Spirit, and they won't. We need to. How many of you know we believe in the Bible? We believe it's inerrant. We believe it's the Word of God. We believe it has full authority. But their whole premise of not believing God moves is that, I mean, God doesn't speak to you. It's just the Bible. Does that make sense to you? I mean, if, if God. Now, if you'll talk to them and say this, if you'll say, well, you know, God made me to know something, they'll go, well, I can, I can handle that. But if you say, 
God spoke to me, they'll go, no, 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 God doesn't speak to you. Does he see? So sometimes it's just semantics. But it's almost like they overdo the letter of the law, the word. They, they live by the letter of the word, and they won't let the spirit move at all. And that's, that sounds like judging, so I'm going to shut up right there. But I know this, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live a godly life. Romans 8 and 9. You're not controlled by your sinful nature. Why? Because you're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. I want to tell you what. It, it's, it's, we have three enemies in the world. We have the world, we have the devil, and we have our flesh. Three things opposing the things of God. And I'm telling you, to fight that battle without the help of the Holy Spirit is a losing cause. So go ahead and realize that maybe what's missing in your fight to live a godly life is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit enabling you to do so. Amen? The Holy Spirit, number two, empowers me to live a supernatural life. And that's what we've been talking about. Acts 10, 38, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how he did. That's why he ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, he said in Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In fact, that's my next. For number three, the Holy Spirit empowers me to fulfill my purpose and calling in life. Now, when I say that, I mean my ministry. But you, you don't have to be in ministry. You could be called to be a whatever you're called to be, whatever place in life. Maybe it's in business. Maybe it's in medicine. Maybe it's in education. Maybe it's in law. But God has given you a purpose in your life. And I want to tell you something, you can't complete what God has you in for you in this life unless the Holy Spirit comes on you and anoints you with the ability to do it. And an attempt to do it without Him is just going to be frustration. Amen? And so you have to have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, this is Jesus talking. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, for he's an, He, the Spirit, has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the press will be set free. That's Jesus talking. That's not Pastor Steve saying the Spirit's low on me because he's sent me to preach. And No, that's Jesus saying. It's the Spirit of the Lord upon me that's anointing me to do what I'm doing. And if he needed the Holy Spirit to do what he's doing in this earth, how much more do you and I need the Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. You believe this this morning? Amen. And you might say, well, what about those things I don't understand? What about, what about tongues and all those kind of things? Well, just don't worry about that right now. Yes, I believe in speaking in other tongues. I've done it with power, and I've seen miracles through it. But see, even some of this same material I saw supporting cessationists. In fact... <laughs> Bless their hearts. I, I came across a document. I actually downloaded it into my iBooks. A whole conference given for cessationists, and the title of the teaching, four sessions, was How Cessationists Can Deal with the Pentecostalization of the Entire Global Church. I don't know about you, but the Pentecostalization of the entire global church is some really good news to me. Amen. Praise God. I mean, the whole global church is being Pentecostalized. You know what that means? I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you that I'm enough into missions and for world evangelism to know that the only place the church is growing is where the Spirit of God is alive. Cessation churches are just turning over. There's, there's, there's literally no measured growth where the Holy Spirit is not dependent upon the move in power. And so the church, more, the world church more and more is like, and, and not just charismatic churches, not just non-denominational churches, not just Pentecostal churches. I'm talking every denomination, every move of God in the entire globe Growth is happening at the point where the Holy Spirit is in believed in and released. I've told you all the story about the Presbyterian missionary we met in the hospital. He was a doctor. He came in to see our son, and he found out we were pastors. And he goes, he's Presbyterian. Now, some Presbyterians are, some Presbyterians aren't, right? But particular Presbyterian church he went to and who supported him 
were cessationists in leadership. And so here he comes back from some dark third world country where there's voodoo and all this stuff. And I'll never forget, he's sitting on that little wheelie chair in James's room. And he says, I want to ask y'all something. And he wheels back to the hall and he looks this way and he looks that way. And he comes back in and he whispers because he don't want anybody to hear because he's a Presbyterian. Do y'all believe in the Holy Ghost and the spiritual things and the Holy Spirit moving? We said, yes, we do. I knew you did. I do too. Don't tell my church. <laughs> he said, nobody on the mission field I know would dare be where we are if we didn't know the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He said, you know what he said? He said, you don't have to see but one person get levitated by an evil spirit to you be wanting you some Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> right then, right then, when you see evil manifest by a witch doctor who you don't need to laugh at because he or she is operating in a power of darkness, you don't have a one encounter with that witch doctor. You realize, I ain't going back over there without the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus told his disciples, don't do anything. I know I've called you. I know I've commissioned you. I know I've given you a, 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 what we call the great commandment. He'd already, he'd already told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all the nations. He had already commissioned them. But he said, but wait, don't go yet. But you go to Jerusalem. You pray and you wait until you receive the promise of the Father. Because when you receive that promise... Then you'll have the power to deal with darkness. I'm telling you, it's, it, discipleship can't do it. Teaching can't do it. Peter, we've talked about him for a couple of weeks, had been discipled personally by Jesus by three and a half years and failed the final test the night Jesus was arrested. Think about it. He'd been discipled by the best discipler there ever was. He didn't just know Jesus. He lived with him. And then when the test came, he failed it in weakness and fear. But then Acts chapter 2 came and he waited and he received the power of the Holy Spirit. And moments later, he's standing in the public temple to the very guys he's been hiding from. He points his finger at them and he says, I'm standing here today in the name of the one you murdered on a cross. And I'm here to tell you that it says in his name that you're saved. And, and I mean, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit spoke through him and the people were cut to the heart. And they cried out, what must we do to be saved? And I'm closing with this. Here's the answer he said. Here's how Peter answered that. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So how do I receive? And I'm closing. First of all, you know you need the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're a Christian and you've never really experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you haven't known. I'm telling you right now, Jesus said, if you're thirsty, I'll fill you. So if you're not thirsty, say, God, make me thirsty. Realize your need for the Holy Spirit right now. Maybe you've never even been saved. So the beginning part is to give your life for Jesus. So real quickly, how do I see? Number one, repent. And that, that sounds like a strong word. Repent just means change your mind and start going another direction. Repent of the way you've been living on yourself. And just say, from now I'm going to live for Jesus. If you haven't been baptized, be baptized. It's in there. It's a, it's a command of God. Be baptized. Fully surrender to God. Just fully surrender everything you have to Him. Confess every known sin to him. You see, you can't earn the Holy Spirit, but you sure have to make a place suitable for him to dwell. Does that make sense to you? Debbie and I are sitting out by our fire pit, and I'm talking about this a couple mornings ago. And I said, it's like if somebody said, hey, man, I've got a 2022 Range Rover. I'll let you keep and drive for free while I'm out of the country. Which y'all know, that's what I wanted for my birthday. I didn't get it. But anyway, no. <laughs> you, I, you, what can I have to pay you? You don't have to pay me anything. You couldn't afford it if you had to. But I'm going to let you have it on one condition. What? 
Go in that nasty garage of yours and clean it up because I ain't putting my car in that garage. <laughs> and if you'll keep your garage clean, I'll let my Range Rover live in there and you can use it. I know that's the crudest illustration any preacher ever came up on Pentecost Sunday. But do you understand? You can't earn the Holy Spirit, but you've got to clean the garage out and give him a place to dwell because he doesn't want to come live amongst all my mess. That's good preaching whether you believe it or not. Amen. So if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. There's no need to be unconfessed. Just repent, confess, surrender, and then ask him. And once you've asked him, believe. Because I'm going to give you one more verse and I'm done. Luke 11, put it up. This, and I promise we're done. I'm going to pray for you. Jesus said in Luke 11, verse 9, And so I tell you, keep on asking. And you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking. You'll find it. Keep on knocking. The door will be open to you. We use that verse a lot, but most of us don't realize he's talking about a particular thing. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Verse 11. You fathers, if you... If your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not, Jesus said. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, say the rest of it with me, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. So ask, and if you aren't satisfied, keep on asking. Seek, and if you don't think you found Him, keep on seeking. Amen. Knock, and if you don't think it's open, keep on knocking. And Jesus is pretty much giving you a guarantee of an answered prayer here. Now, one more thing. Remember this. It's not an it. It's a he. He's a third person of the Godhead. And he wants to come into your life in a dynamic way and take hold of your life together with you. Manifest the lordship of Jesus in your life and give you a life you never dreamed you could ever live. Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, we sang it at the first of the service. We say, come rest on us. If I were you right now, I might even just present my body. I might, I might just maybe hold my hands in front of me with my palms up or something, just in a receiving uh, posture and just say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I desperately need your Holy Spirit. Lord, as a church, there's no way we can even begin to fulfill the commission that you've given us to make a difference in our world and our community unless we are just baptized in the power and in the righteousness and the holiness of your Holy Spirit. So, Jesus, we confess every sin. We repent of our sin. We turn and repent of a love of sin, and, and we, we, we return from that, and we purpose to love what God loves. And we ask you to forgive us and believe we receive it, and we ask you to fill us to overflowing every day with your precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I heard a man say this. It's not like you, you need more of the Holy Spirit as much as he needs more of you. So, Holy Spirit, take all of me. Resings it. I surrender all to you. We surrender all to you, and we desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit with every evidence that you would give us, Lord God. We desire the fruit of the Spirit in our life. We desire the gifts and the power and the ability of the Holy Spirit in our individual lives and in this ch church as a whole. We cannot do it without being baptized and filled every day in the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we humble ourselves and we say, fill us to overflowing. And we believe we have received it based on your word in Luke 11. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. With every head bowed just for another few moments, <laughs> listen, if you've never made that initial decision to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus, do it right now. He said, I place before you a choice. You have a choice. He always gives you a choice. You've got to make a choice. To not make a choice is to choose against it. But he said, I'm placing before you today life and death. Choose life that you may live and your children after you. He said, if, he said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If anyone will confess me as Lord, believe that I raised, was raised from the dead, you will be saved. So right now, just you don't even have to say the right thing. You just got to mean it with your heart. Pray a prayer like this. Say something like, Lord Jesus, I turn from my old way of living my self-driven life and I surrender my life to you today and I say Jesus from this day forward be Lord of my life from this day forward I will follow you forgive my sins for they are many 
I believe you died for me and rose again. I believe you died in my place. And I put my faith in what you have done for me, not in what I've done. And I believe from this day forward, the only reason I'm going to heaven is that because you died for me and rose again. But I thank you for eternal life. I thank you for saving me. I thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that I'm a Christian. Thank you that I'm a member of the family of God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And so, Father, I thank you for every person who prayed that prayer, that they are born again in this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Just the beginning here in a pursuit of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and worship God for just a few minutes before I pray a blessing over you and send you out back into your mission field. Let's sing and worship God.
<laughs> that song about healed my knees right over there, man. I, praise God. Amen. No greater love I know. Amen. Praise God. And now, may the, may the love, the steadfast covenant love of God, your heavenly Father, may the amazing abounding grace of your Lord and Savior Jesus, and may the friendship, the fellowship, the leading, the guiding, the teaching, the reminding, the helping of the Holy Spirit, your friend, be with you and in you and upon us all as once again we leave the safety of this church and return to the mission field that is our world, our sphere of influence, walking in godly life, walking in supernatural life, fulfilling our mission on earth, not in our own strength, but in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit who is manifesting the Lordship of Jesus for the glory and joy of God the Father in our lives. And everybody said, amen, amen, and amen. I love you all like crazy. God bless you. Thank you for being. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. Sign up for Growth Track, Heart for the House offerings. If you want to bring them down, that would be great. We love you. Thank you much. Amen. <laughs>